Well, good morning, Tri-State. I uh, hope you don't mind, but I am going to go ahead and pray for us again before I jump into things. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I, uh, I sense your presence today. Uh, Lord, I pray that every person in this room senses your presence. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, in these next few minutes, our ears would be tuned into you. Uh, our hearts would be turned towards you and that you would really truly speak to us. Uh, that when we walk out of this place, our lives will be changed, our lives will be challenged, um, and that we would forever see ourselves walking with you in a very different way than when we first came in. Uh, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Uh, so this is a continuation of our sermon, Counterintuitive. And for all of you guys who uh, have been here, haven't been here, basically what we're talking about is there's these concepts of culture that we tend to think about, uh, and then we read through scripture and we see everything's flipped upside down. It's very different than the way the rest of the world tends to think. I get the blessing of teaching on how to be truly great. And I know what you guys are thinking. Oh, he must be sharing his life story. So I'm going to start off with uh, just the 10 best things that got me to this place. Uh, the first one is obviously good looks. <laughs> Got to have them good looks. Number two, humility. <laughs> I'm one of the most humble people I know, and it's really gotten me far. Number three, humor. And four through ten, just repeat the first three over and over again. Um, no, but uh, I actually wanted to do something with you. We don't tend to do this much at Tri-State, uh, but I wanted to play a game with you guys. I'm calling this the greatness game. So here's how this is going to work. We are going to put up a few different pictures up on the screen, uh, and I'm going to ask you guys whether you think this person is great or not. All right? So first person we have up is LeBron James. Great. How many think it's great? All right, we got a couple. How many think not great? Okay. All right. Uh, next, oh, well, let's just be honest. He has like eight championships with 20 different teams. Um, Mother Teresa, how many think great? All right. How many think not great? All right, we got a couple not great. Okay, that's great. Uh, next one. Oh, I, I don't know how I got up there, but let's go ahead and judge this anyway. Uh, how many greats? Great. My wife, you, yeah, your hand, Betty, yeah, both hands up. Thank you. Uh, not great. All right, we'll talk to some of you guys afterwards. All right. Uh, Tiger Woods, great? Was great. Okay, we got some was greats. Uh, how many not great? Okay. All right, next one. Tim Tebow, great. All right, not great. There's some not great hands. Okay, next one. Harrison Ford. Come on, ladies. Great. All right. Come on, we all know you all had a crush on him at one point. All right. Uh, not great. Uh, I actually saw something the other day. I saw his son killed him the other day with a lightsaber. I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, it was very tragic. Uh, if you haven't seen Star Wars yet, my bad. Uh, all right, great. Great, yes. All right, any not great? All right, the ones that would say not great are in the twos and threes right now. Okay. Um, all right, we have Rosa Parks. Great. Great. Any not great? Oh, that's, uh, that's not great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Arlington Cemetery. Great. Men and women that have served, that have given their lives up for this country, for our freedom. <laughs> Definitely great. I'm not going to ask the question for not great because we don't want to get into that. Um, but here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to get back to these in just a little bit. Uh, but tonight, uh, tonight, today, I usually speak at night. Uh, today, we're going to be focused on how to be truly great. Uh, and this is a really interesting exercise to do and to ask for friends, you know, people that you think are great in your life. Somebody else may not agree with that. But we're going to be talking about what greatness looks like. And Jesus focuses on this concept in Matthew 18, 1 through 5. Uh, I speak from NLT in case any of you guys are on your phone app. I speak NLT. Um, it's going to be up here on the screen. But 18, 1 through 5, uh, we get this interesting situation, this scenario where we see the disciples come up to Jesus, and they say this. It says, About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest 
in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes this child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. That's not the answer the disciples were looking for. See, when the disciples asked this, when they came to him asking this question, they're trying to get an idea of, okay, what, what, what's a list of five things, ten things that I need to do to, to achieve greatness, aren't they? They're trying to figure out how to be the best. They're, they're followers of him. They're trying to figure out, okay, what steps do I need to take to kind of work my way up into this position? Uh, and when you start to look at a passage like this and you start to see the answer that Jesus gives, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, who would have thought he would brought up a child to give his analogy? And why would he do that? I mean, you know, when you think about a child, there's certain dynamics and, and remove all the, the craziness that a child brings up a two and four-year-old, they're nuts. Um, but think about what a child uh, often brings into uh, a, a situation. A child blindly trust. I've learned this on a, on a few really bad occasions, because my uh, Silas, uh, my, my two-year-old, uh, almost three, um, he loves to do this thing, like, he just will walk off the step and, like, expect you to catch him at any moment. I could be six steps down, and he'd be like, hey, uh, he trusts that I'm going to—I've never dropped him. I've been close. Uh, I've never dropped him once. See, he's not worried about whether he's going to fall. He expects me to catch him. A child holds no power, which parents out here, you guys might disagree with this. But hear me out. A child holds no power. If I want to beat up a kid, I could, I think. <laughs> they're, they're very weak. They're very dependent. They're very, they, they don't, there's nothing in their lives that they've built up to actually have power, except temper tantrums. But you know what I mean? Like, there, there's nothing that they have done. Uh, a child is, is humble. Again, they haven't built up anything. They haven't gone through life to a point where they can actually have pride on what they've established. It, they're young. They're, they're, they're enjoying every little moment of life. They're enjoying every situation. It's about having fun and just being in the moment. Not worried about, okay, do I have, you know, I got to make sure I have every day in line. I got to make sure— I, it, they, they're just going day by day. A child thinks in simple terms, black and white. You see, so often with our culture today, you know, we, we, we cross over these gray lines. We cross over these concepts of, man, it, am I stepping on to, uh, toes? Is, is this PC? You know, a kid's going to come up to you and be like, hey, you're fat. Like, <laughs> like hey, yeah, that— that dress is hideous, you know? Like, Dad, don't wear that. You know, like, they, they tell you how it is. You know what I mean? Like, have you ever had, like, the amount of times that I, we've had our kids just say something that's just like, this is, no, this is how it is. Like, I, my son said something the other day. I'm not going to say what it was. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, Tucker, we do not say that. He goes, yeah, we do. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> can't get out of that one. Um, the child is innocent. And again, bear with me. Um, they're still learning the difference between right and wrong. It's not that they don't push the boundaries, but they're still learning the, the difference between right and wrong. As we get older, we, we know better, and we consciously make decisions in the wrong category. We consciously make decisions in the right category. And we make uh, hundreds and thousands of those decisions every day, knowing, okay, if I do this, it'll be beneficial. If I do this, it won't. This donut sitting here, it's not going to be beneficial, but <laughs> it's going to be good. Uh, you know, it's, we, we make those type of decisions all the time. Uh, on the conference trip, we had this, uh, we had a bunch of different speakers that came. Um, and the one speaker that came, it was, it, she, it was really cool. She shared her, her whole life story um, about different things that she had struggled with. Um, and she had a, uh, they, they're called equipping labs, where you kind of got to go in and, and they, they focused in on some of their stuff. Um, and 
she said something that really caught the attention of the, all the students that were, uh, got to be in it. And, and she said this. She said, um, God is the one who decides the definition of what is good or not good. Not us. God. See, when God made his creation, he saw that it was good. That's the first time we ever see what good would even look like or what, it, what, what good would even be like. We see that God holds the definition of what is good. He alone is the one that can say what is good or great. Um, and when it's left to decide, uh, when, it, when it's, that definition is left to be decided by us, it turns into a, a bunch of, of object, objective uh, opinions, right? What, what did we just see on the screen here? Some people thought the people were great, others disagreed, right? See, anytime it's left to us to decide, we, we start to see, man, the answers that I have, the opinion that I have differs from this person or this person or this person. So how do we get through culture? How do we get through this life trying to hold on to everybody else's definitions of these things? We have one person we should go to to find the answer, right? And that's Jesus Christ. That's our God that we come here to worship every day. He alone holds the definition what is great to one group of people might not be great to others. You know, imagine, you know, uh, somebody might, might say, man, this guy who, he just, he just broke the world record for home runs. That guy is great. But what is that to somebody who really doesn't care about baseball? They're like, is that good? Is that, you know, he had like 3,000 home runs. Like, you know, they don't, you don't, we don't know what's great or not great if you don't care about that area, Right? So that definition can constantly shift and constantly struggle. Here's the deal. We all want to be recognized. We all want to be great in the different areas and the different positions that we hold in life, don't we? That title could be uh, a parent. Um, it could be uh, as, a, as a husband or wife, as an accountant, as a nurse, as a pastor, as a store clerk, whatever it might be, we want to be great at what we do. And, and if greatness isn't something that we're necessarily striving for, why? Um, and, and if it's not something that we're striving for, um, we still want to be recognized for what we do. Um, and so when we aren't noticed for the things that we do, for when we aren't noticed for the things that, uh, that we have in our lives, we can fall into these pits of insecurity— we can fall into pits of a lack of self-worth. We can fall into these, these pits of a fear that we have no purpose on this earth, right? It's amazing how quickly we, we can start going into that category when, when it, we, we go and we don't feel appreciated, when we don't feel like people see what we do. Or the other part of it is we get filled with bitterness and we just choose to just get through life. We don't really, you know, nobody's going to care anyway, so I'm just going to kind of do whatever I want and, and you know, I'll, I'm going to do the bare minimum of, of what it requires for my job, the bare minimum that it requires as a parent, the bare minimum of whatever else it might be. We want recognition. It's funny, there's a, there's a list of, of different struggles that I think we, be, we tend to want to be recognized for, de depending on our, our phase of life. Uh, awards, you know, sports awards, music awards, um, employee of the month awards, you know, all those, you know, those different things. Like you get like a free coffee from the workplace that you're at if you get the employee of the month award. Um, pay raises. You know, sometimes we think, man, I, I worked and I worked and I worked and I didn't get a pay raise. Like, you know, we get frustrated by that. Job promotions. We work for job promotions. We think, man, I've earned it. And sometimes when we see somebody else get the job promotion over us, we get bitter. We get frustrated and say, I deserve that. Sometimes it's just a simple thank you. Guys, I get sometimes, you know, we, David just said we had 70 volunteers for VBS. That's incredible. But sometimes, you know, what if, what if we missed a couple of you guys and saying thank you? You know, there's, there's anytime that happens, there's this bitterness that can build. Even if it's not major, it's enough like, man, they, they didn't even say thank you. Like, we expect it, right? 
And we should say thank you. I'm not saying, like, hey, just ignore, you know, ignore people that uh, did something nice for you. No, we should, we should say thank you and stuff. But here's the thing is, is we expect it. A lot of times we do stuff, and by the time we get to the end, we expect we deserve some type of recognition. It's human nature. We desire that. We, 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 we want some of that. Here's, um, I was laughing. I was thinking about... Uh, through high school, through all those different, middle school, all those different things, you, you acquire trophies. Uh, we're so proud of our trophies. Our parents display our trophies. Uh, there was a stretch where I had, like, my trophies on my desk and different things. Um, I've been out of high school for about 11 years now. Uh, I don't think I've looked at my trophies for, like, 11 years. <laughs> you know, we, we strive to get it. We strive to earn it. But then life moves on, doesn't it? And we stop paying attention to those trophies that are sitting on our desk. And, and every so often we go back and we're like, oh yeah, that was cool. But now life is different. Life changes. Uh, when we get to the point of, uh, of life, um, you know, kind of that end of life, you hear, you hear people talk that, that are, are, are nearing the, the, the far parts of, of life, uh, whether it's on their deathbed or even before they get to that point. They, they look back and I guarantee you, the people you talk with, the people that are at that stage of life aren't sitting there thinking, man, I really should have pushed for that other job promotion. You don't hear that, do you? The focus is, man, I should have figured out how to spend more time with my family. I should have figured out how to create more memories. I should have just not focused, been so focused on my work and focused on the people right in front of me that I love. Why is that? See, God designed us for relationship. And when we look at Scripture, when we look at what He has to say, He's like, listen, you will get your reward. It, it's not in this life, but it's to come. So invest in me right now, and you'll see the fruit of it. See, the memories are, are one of those things that, you know, it's always significant things in our lives that tend to stick out in, in, as far as our memories, right? It's usually not the dull moments, right? Um, you know, like World Cup, the, the, I forget which game it was, but it was 0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, both teams had already qualified. Like, that's not the one that they're going to replay over and over again. <laughs> look how they didn't score. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we look at the memories that are significant. We look at those moments where, where uh, you know, something magical, like my... Tucker, my oldest son, his first time saying I love you, this is why I'm going to remember it because it's significant, was to Siri. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have, my brother just happened to be filming the video, and Siri goes, how may I help you? And Tucker just goes, I love you. <laughs> to my iPhone. <laughs> but I will remember that forever. You know, it's it, the, these significant moments. When I look back at my life, I can remember the day I accepted Christ. I can remember the day I got called into ministry. I can remember the day that I met my wife. I can remember the day we got married. I can remember the day my kids were born. The significant moments, they stick. And even more so, the moments that stick even more significantly are the moments where I sensed the love of God. When God came in and he spoke, and I knew in that moment he was real. When I started to, to, to recognize, when I, when I look at this, I'm like, man, why is, it, why is it that we miss those type of opportunities? Why is it that we don't get these many moments in our life where we see God moving, where we see God creating these type of memories, these moments where I'm like, man, there, there was God. And I started to think about that. I recognize it's because we aren't willing to put ourselves in the situations that allow him to work so that we can experience that type, of, that type of love, that type of faith. I hate to say this, but greatness is not watching, binge-watching Netflix over the weekend. Greatness isn't about us. It's about the one who came to this place, who sacrificed himself, named Jesus Christ, who came to serve so that we could know him. It was never about him. It was never about his will, but the Father's. So what if we consciously start to choose to make those kind of memories? 
What if we start to choose a life where living with our friends and family was about putting our faith and showing the greatness of God, showing the greatness of what Jesus can be in our lives, and taking steps of faith to allow God to work by putting ourselves in the situations? So what does this look like for us? I think there's three, there's more than three, but I think there's three key things that we fear sacrificing. We, sa- we, we fear sacrificing time, money, and safety. There's more, but these are three major categories. And if you start to look at your lives, you're going to start to see that these three things are the one things that kind of paralyze us from moving forward. Time. Man, it seems like time is too short. The day is too short. Uh, those of you who have kids, your, your kids kind of run your life, and you're running around, running errands, doing all these different things. Um, you know, we sacrifice for our, our kids. We sacrifice a lot for our kids. Um, and not that we shouldn't put our kids first in a lot of things, but I think what happens is we eventually let our kids become gods in our family instead of letting God be God in our family. That's scary for us. That's, that's a scary thing to, to think about. It's, it's scary when we start to put work ahead of God. It's scary when we start to put kids ahead of God. It's scary when we start to put all these different dynamics. And listen, I'm, I'm, I, I get, like, you're, there's a lot of families you guys have to run around, and, and that's just the nature. I, I mean, I was in sports and stuff, so I, I get it. But what are we doing to supplement um, what are we doing to put God in our house when life gets busy? How, how, are we, how are we doing with finding people who are also in the same situation as saying, hey, how can we connect? How can we just stay connected together? Um, here's, what the, here's what the world says. The world says about time, it says the world says it's about us and living it up, living it up while we have time. We got to cram in everything that we can. We got to get it all in now. We got to do it right here. God's view, it says he invented time. Our time is his. Use it for him. So if we're supposed to use time for him, if we're supposed to use this life for him, what does that look like? Even in the chaos of all the other things that we have going on, what would that look like if we started to use our time for his, for him? Money. Man, this is, this is a tricky one. Money is probably one of the biggest stressors in any household. Um, I've even been learning from, you know, talking with different people. It doesn't matter how much money you have, whether you are rich, whether you're poor, it's still a stressor. It's amazing how this works. Um, but it doesn't matter what we have. Uh, here's what the, the world says. Um, success is based on money. Make as much as you can so you can buy as much as you can. There's this mentality that, man, do what you can, you know, uh, work towards that job promotion, work towards uh, the pay raise, work towards, you know, making as much money as possible, because then you, you don't have to stress about the things in your life that, that you want to buy, that you will help make your family life more comfortable. God's view says this, rich or poor, all things come from God and are not ours, but are his. Man, what would that look like? If we truly took that to heart, if we said, man, everything that you have, that you've given to me, God, I'm going to give back to you. So we read through Scripture, we read through Acts, I mean, the Church of Acts wasn't perfect, uh, but when the Spirit really moved throughout everybody, and we see that He scatters around everything, it says everything was shared. Homes, money, food, everything, all the resources were used to work in sync with everybody who was a part of that church community. And I think we do a pretty good job here at, at, at Tri-State. I, I, I get so many opportunities to see people pouring into one another. That's one of my favorite parts about this church. And, and you'll hear this over and over from people is it feels like family. And that's because people are praying for each other. We, we care about the needs that are going on. I've seen so many of you guys pouring back into people in need, whether it's meals, whether it's rides to doctor's appointments, to the airport, uh, whether it's, you know, somebody who is just struggling with physical ailments or a loss of a loved one. I, I've seen this community come together and pour into, into one another. And I'm telling you, the people on the receiving end see Christ when that happens. I promise you. So if we can do that among our church family, 
What would that look like if we start to translate that into our coworkers, into people that are a little bit harder to deal with? Because if they haven't seen that, you know, our church body, I feel like we have seen that, but if they haven't seen that, imagine what that would look like in their life, in their lives, as they see Christ through you. Safety. Oh, man, this is a hard one, especially if you have kids. Um, Safety is always, you know, it, we get nervous, you know, oh, that, that's a bad part of town, or, you know, you may, you, there's all these different comments that you, you tend to hear about different things. The worldview says protect yourself and your family. God's view says protect those who can't protect themselves. Scripture talks so much about orphans and widows. The, the, those people at that time in Scripture, they were outcasts. I mean, it was basically, if you, if you didn't have family to take care of you, you were, you were not in a good place. See, we should be focused on pouring in to this community and pouring in to one another. Um, in Matthew 5, you guys are familiar with this. Um, if we want to look at what greatness looks like, if we want to look at, at, at the, this entire concept, uh, we get this Sermon on the Mount. Um, and when we read through the Beatitudes, this is Matthew 5, 3 through 10. That's not going to be up on the screen. I'm just going to read it for you. Um, we get this list of ways that God, the people that God blesses. It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when, you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. That's a powerful passage. Think about every person that was listed in there. It's not the strong. It's not people that, you know, the, the ones that are um, at, at even probably the strongest point of their life. It's people that are broken whether it's emotionally, financially. People that are broken about what's happening in the world and they desire to see peace. There are people that are broken and, and, and sense a, a, a need to, to reach out to those who are struggling. It's people that aren't focused on themselves. Man, if that's not the most counterintuitive way of thinking in this day and age. I mean, you turn on the TV and everything is focused about satisfying yourself and doing what you want and buying this and buying that and and again you know buying things it's not it's not a it's not bad but if we aren't focused and we aren't aware uh, of what God is stirring up in our heart of what God is calling us into of what what we're trying to what he's trying to speak into us listen the spirit dwells within us he's always there and yet I feel like so many times we get so busy that we aren't wanting to listen to what he's trying to speak into us. What he's trying to call us into. Whether, it, you know, even if he's trying to tell us, hey, slow down. I feel like sometimes we're like, well, I don't have time to slow down. You know, greatness is, is not about us. It's focusing, on about, it's focusing on Christ and what Christ is calling us into. Greatness is the opposite of self-recognition. 
If we live this life focused on getting rewards, on focused on being recognized, focused on, on people seeing what we do in this life, we're never going to be satisfied. Because people are people. You know, we, we miss it every so often. We, we, we don't catch it every single time. I have a couple challenges I wanted to give to you guys. Um, this was something I felt called, uh, uh, called out on um, just when we were out on conference. Uh, you know, it's easy to be a pastor and to focus on this stuff, you know, as part of my job. Uh, and I felt like God was really calling me out that, hey, you, you know, you lead spiritually at church, but not in your home, um, which is hard. You know, you come and you pour in here and then you go home and you just don't do as much. And I was like, man, I, I don't want that to happen. Um, and the whole conference trip, I told my students this, the whole conference trip, I was like waiting for this like emotional connection with God. Uh, you know, you go to these conference things and you expect that. Um, and the whole time I just felt flatlined. Like I thought the speakers were great. I thought the worship was great, but like it was just like I, I felt more focused on the, on the students and, and, you know, hoping that they hear something. Uh, and so I didn't hear much. Uh, I didn't sense much. I was like, God, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. Um, and there was like nothing. It was just silence. Uh, and I'm not even kidding. It was a 10-minute window. So we were there for a week. Um, and I got this 10-minute window uh, where we were like in the middle of worship. And I know my wife looked over at me like weird because I'm just like on my phone typing. Um, which makes it look like I'm distracted, but I felt like God gave me this whole list of things that I, I want to do in my house and things that I feel called to do as a husband and as a father so that my sons uh, and my family will see God working in practical ways. And these aren't difficult things. They weren't things that, that I even I, I think are that scary um, in some ways, but are simple things that we can do is just taking a step of faith and saying, God, show me how to make my faith real to everyone else around me. It's a simple thing. Show me how to make my faith real to everybody who sees me so that when they see me, they see the Father. That was Jesus' biggest prayer constantly was, Lord, let my Father's will be done, not my will but His. Let them see the Father. Constant, constant, constant. And then what happened? He died, he rose again, and his Father said, Jesus Christ will be the name above all other names. And that was because of sacrifice and selflessness. So here's the things. Great. Uh, three, three challenges for you guys. Invite somebody from your neighborhood over to your house. Have them for dinner. Simple enough. Hopefully you can cook. Um, have them over for dinner. And then after dinner, have your entire family pray for them. Whole family. How awesome would that look like, uh, especially if you have kids and your kids are praying over your adult neighbors? What would that look like? Um, number two, make one day this month a serving day for your family. As parents, ask your kids in what ways do you feel like God wants us to serve today? Go do it. I tell you what, if you have a kid under 10 especially, buckle up. I mean, again, a child doesn't think about risks, do they? You know, what if, you're, what if your kid's like, hey, I, I feel like we need to go in the inner city and just talk to, you know, share the gospel with someone. I mean, how cool would that be to see, to, for, for a kid to see their parents say, you know what, we're going to take our faith seriously. And we're just going to take a simple day and we're going to serve the way that you feel called to serve. And you start that dialogue within your family. You start that dialogue a as a one unit and you will see memories. You will see God move in ways that you will never forget. I promise. It'll be life-changing, not just for you, but for your kids. I, I think one reason that we see kids falling away from, from the church by the time they get into college is they've never seen their faith lived out the way that God really wants us to. Because honestly, coming to church on a Wednesday and a Sunday gets boring if that's all you do. I mean, I, I know it sounds awful, but it's true. I mean, it's kind of like, well, I guess, you know, it's Sunday. <laughs> I guess I got to get up earlier than I usually do. And, you know, it's, and, and if you, some of you guys that are out here and, and that's you, um, 
I want to challenge you, start looking at this differently. The, the biggest thing that this group of, group of people is about, the reason we have church, the reason we have community, it's not because of having a great band, it's not because of having a great speaker, it's so that when we go out and do ministry and it gets really difficult, we can always come back to this church body and find encouragement and support to go and do it again. That's the purpose of church. It's to worship our Father. It's to come together and celebrate what He's doing. And if persecution and being made fun of and being called out uh, and, and being beat down and, and, and finding different ways that people are talking negative about you because of your faith, then it's a victory. You're doing something right and people are recognizing it. It says it right here. If I, We're no greater than our Father. And He was slaughtered and, and, and hung up on the cross. So I think we can take a few comments towards us to say, wow, that must be one of those Christian people. Like, that's like nothing. That should be, you should be, you should take that as, as a point of pride. Last one is another simple one. Take a coworker out for coffee. Learn what's going on in their life and pray for them afterwards. That simple again. Guys, I'm just throwing a couple suggestions. This is, this is the tip of the iceberg. But I believe that you guys have the ability to go out and to live for Christ, and so your greatness will be in His name. I believe that God is calling each of you guys to do some different things. It's so fun when you get to hear different people's passions and, and, and hear what they're, they're, they, they're interested in or hear what's going on in their, uh, with the neighbors or, or whatever it might look like. And I think that uh, as, as we go out and do this, my favorite thing that I get to, get to do is, is when you hear people go and do it, and then you find out about what happened. So I'm serious. I, I want you guys to take these challenges serious, and when you go and do it, share it. Throw it up on the, the, the Tri-State Facebook page. You know, throw it up. Uh, you know, talk to us. Uh, say, hey, I would love to share this, uh, you know, this upcoming Sunday about what's going on uh, in my neighborhood because I, I took this thing for uh, seriously and God is doing an amazing work. A child doesn't typically focus on the risks. A child doesn't judge a person on show, social status or looks. A child puts faith in their father and mother that they will protect, that they will direct, and that they will provide. How much more will our Father protect, direct, and provide? Remember, Christ is the image of greatness because he came to serve and to sacrifice so that we could have the strength to live as he did. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for uh, everyone sitting here. Lord, I pray that this will be a message that really sits home and, um, or that you would do an amazing work in the families here. Lord, I pray that, uh, that we would truly be sent out from this place. That 2018, the, the, the last half of it, uh, going all the way into next year, that it would be different. That we would see things differently that we would recognize the opportunities that you want to use us to speak into the lives of those who are lost, those who are broken, those who are weak. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that your son made. Lord, that he is great. And that he died for us so that we could have him dwell within us so that we could then have the strength to go and to serve. Lord, I pray that you would relieve fear, that you would fill us with boldness, and that you would send us out. In your son's name, amen.